2. Machiavelli Thus, the counterpart to Castiglione was the Italian statesman Niccolo de Bernardo de Machiavelli, 1469-1527. Machiavelli's, the prince, El Principe, or De Principatibus, was first written in 1513 and was printed in 1532. His discourses on the first ten books of Titus Livius are also, like the prince, concerned with the theory of civil government. According to Lerner, Machiavelli sought to distinguish the realm of what ought to be and the realm of what is. He rejected the first for the second. The temporal world was to Machiavelli the real world. Man's necessities are governed by that world, however appealing and compelling ideals may be. A semblance of conformity to any ideal world men may believe in is advisable, but the temporal world has its necessities, and man must observe them. Machiavelli noted, Prudent men make the best of circumstances in their actions, and, although constrained by necessity to a certain course, make it appear as if done from their own liberality. The basic and essential reality, then, is the temporal world. Machiavelli was formally respectful towards the church, but personally contemptuous. He was not formally an atheist because he was too indifferent to God for such a stance. The basic reality of Machiavelli's temporal world is not God, but power. Sovereignty and power are inescapable realities of any system of thought. If they are denied to God, they are not thereby eliminated. Like all the attributes of God, sovereignty and power, when denied to God, are simply transferred to the human order because they are inescapable aspects of reality. Whether formally or informally, some aspects of the human order is divinized. For Machiavelli, then, human power and sovereignty are the realities which must govern man. The human problem is the conflict of diversity, the disunity of states in Italy, the conflict of men struggling for power. This is Machiavelli's many. The source of unity is thus power. Power concentrated in able hands and the mechanics of power are necessary knowledge if unity is to be gained. As Machiavelli observed, A sagacious legislator of a republic, therefore, whose object is to promote the public good and not his private interests, and who prefers his country to his own successors, should concentrate all authority in himself. The public good is social order, prosperity and power. The virtues Machiavelli's prince should cultivate are the virtues of power wisely administered and retained. Machiavelli agreed with Francesco Vittori that all forms of power have their roots in usurpation. To move in terms of right is to move in terms of a myth. The reality is power. Because the ideal, Christian morality, influences men, it must be formally upheld and formally conformed to, but the true basis of power is power, neither good nor evil, but simply power wisely used and wisely furthered. Hence Machiavelli's admiration for Cesare Borgia. Reviewing thus all the actions of the Duke, I find nothing to blame, on the contrary, I feel bound, as I have done, to hold him up as an example to be imitated by all who, by fortune and with the arms of others, have risen to power. Machiavelli was fully aware of all the facets of Cesare Borgia's career, but to him the results were the criterion. Cesare Borgia was considered cruel, but his cruelty has brought order to the Romagna, united it, and reduced it to peace and fealty. If this is considered well, it will be seen that he was really much more merciful than the Florentine people who, to avoid the name of cruelty, allowed Pistola to be destroyed. Terrorism to gain and consolidate power was thus sometimes very necessary. Machiavelli did not call terror good, 
He simply stated that it was a necessary evil towards a good end, a unity productive of power and the unity and prosperity of power. The Borgia terror had to be weighed against the Borgia gains. After four years, the results of Cesare's labours were unveiled. It was then revealed that no pope had ever been as powerful a secular prince as Alexander VI. True, his successor to the throne of Peter cursed the memory of the Borgias. Nevertheless, these Borgias had given the church gifts which lasted for three centuries. The walls of her cities and the valleys, rivers and hills of her territories remained. They had liberated the church from the dread of being driven out of her own land. Father and son had won new successes for the papacy. In Rome, Colonesi and Orsini had been broken. The baronial houses had been humbled and subordinated. The rulers of ecclesiastical territories, the lord of Urbino, Faenza, Rimini, Camarino, Perugia, Imola, Forli, Pesaro and Piombino had either been expelled or murdered and never before had the College of Cardinals and the Curia been such willing tools in the hand of the Pope. This concept of the use of terror has been extensively condemned and as extensively used in subsequent history. Lenin openly recommended Machiavelli in Left-Wing Communism, An Infantile Disorder, and the communist use of terror is well known. Machiavelli, very early, as a clerk in the Florentine bureaucracy, learned the uses of power and loved it. He clearly recognised the power inherent in a bureaucracy, and instead of being a lazy clerk, his one fear was that his excessive zeal for his work might awaken jealousies and malice. The position of these Florentine clerks, low as it was, gave them a certain superiority, for they had their own desks, and they could drive rich men to desperation by repeated examination of their tax reports. They could make men of prominence wait for permits and withhold powder and pay from celebrated generals. These bureaucrats could release a plague of malice against any individual or against the mass of non-office holders. They were the tiny, ink-stained saints guarding the vestibule of power, the indispensable muck of sovereignty. The Great Council, the standard bearer of justice, the eight of the guard, the six of the board of trade, the ten of liberty, and the numerous commissions and subcommissions made decisions and changes, but in the end they were themselves dependent upon the indolence, indifference, and malice of an anonymous office. For already a man had two lives in Florence, his personal and his documental life and the life on paper was capable of destroying the individual behind it. Machiavelli saw two ideas in conflict, the way men live and the way they ought to live, but a man who always and everywhere would act according to a perfect standard of goodness must, among so many who are not good, eventually be undone. The reality is, the way men live, in terms of evil, but men like the facade of the good. Machiavelli did not call evil good, but he did not struggle against evil. He merely recognised and used it as the basic fact about man and as an essential ingredient of power. The three basic aspects of life are necessita, virtu and fortuna, and power involves a recognition and combination of all three. Since evil rather than good is the truth about life, the basic hypocrisy of Renaissance man was to claim power by ascribing more evil to himself than he possessed. A vast realm of boasting concerning the ability to lie, fantasies of sexual prowess in adulterous relations, murders committed and so on developed among Renaissance men. Machiavelli himself wrote, In hypocrisy I have long since received baptism, confirmation and communion. In lying I even possess a doctor's degree. Life has taught me to temper falsehood with truth and truth with falsehood. Basically, however, Machiavelli's position was one of honest and forthright pragmatism, 
and his pragmatism was less pretentious and more consistent than the formal pragmatism of John Dewey and without Dewey's pious cant. Machiavelli did not clothe his goal with the moralism of the great society. He wanted a successful and working order for Italy and wished to see him for any state without any pretension, so paradise or of morality. His counsel was simple and direct. Therefore, a prudent ruler ought not to keep faith when, by so doing, it would be against his interest, and when the reasons which made him bind himself no longer exist. If all men were good, this precept would not be a good one, but, as they are bad, and would not observe their faith with you, so you are not bound to keep faith with them. Nor have legitimate grounds ever failed a prince who wished to show colourable excuse for the non-fulfilment of his promise. Of this, one could furnish an infinite number of modern examples and show how many times peace has been broken and how many promises rendered worthless by the faithlessness of princes and those that have been best able to imitate the fox have succeeded best. But it is necessary to be able to disguise this character well and to be a great feigner and dissembler And men are so simple and so ready to obey present necessities that one who deceives will always find those who allow themselves to be deceived. I will only mention one modern instance. Alexander VI did nothing else but deceive men. He thought of nothing else and found the occasion for it. No man was ever more able to give assurances or affirm things with stronger oaths, and no man observed them less. However, He always succeeded in his deceptions, as he well knew this aspect of things. It is not therefore necessary for a prince to have all the above-named qualities, but it is very necessary to seem to have them. I would even be bold to say that to possess them and always to observe them is dangerous, but to appear to possess them is useful. Thus, it is well to seem merciful, faithful, humane, sincere, religious, and also to be so, but you must have the mind so disposed that, when it is needful to be otherwise, you may be able to change to the opposite qualities. And it must be understood that a prince, and especially a new prince, cannot observe all those things which are considered good in men, being often obliged, in order to maintain the state, to act against faith, against charity, against humanity, and against religion and therefore he must have a mind disposed to adapt itself according to the wind and as the variations of fortune dictate, and, as I said before, not deviate from what is good if possible, but be able to do evil if constrained. A prince must take great care that nothing goes out of his mouth which is not full of the above-named five qualities, and to see and hear him he should seem to be all mercy, faith, integrity, humanity and religion. And nothing is more necessary than to seem to have this last quality, for men in general judge more by the eyes than by the hands, for every one can see, but very few have to feel. It is necessary for a ruler to learn how not to be good and to use this knowledge and not to use it according to the necessity of the case. Machiavelli, despite his cutting insights, had democratic leanings. For him there was truth in the saying, The voice of the people is the voice of God. For it would almost seem as if the people had some occult virtue. But Machiavelli was more prone to such idealism in dealing with the ancient Rome he admired than in observing Italian realities. A wise ruler he held who had the public good in mind, should concentrate all authority in himself. However, to maintain this concentrated power, the one should involve the many in the administration of it to gain their support. It will not endure long if the administration of it remains on the shoulders of a single individual. It is well then to confide this to the charge of many, for thus it will be sustained by the many. Involvement binds men. It is the nature of men to be as much bound by the benefits that they confer as by those they receive. 
fortune governs men extensively. The origins of various forms of political order are in chance, and before states began, men lived like beasts. Instead of a goal or meaning, the basic aspect of man's life is perpetual movement, that is, change or flux. Religion is important not because it provides meaning, but because it is social cement. It binds the body politic into a firm and workable unity. Machiavelli thus strongly approved of Roman religion because it was a department of states and an instrument of social order. The fear of the gods greatly facilitated all the enterprises which the Senate or its great men attempted. Moreover, religion served in the command of the armies in uniting the people and keeping them well conducted and covering the wicked with shame. It was this use of religion which gave Rome social cohesion, good law and order, and success in all its enterprises. The One thus had become fully imminent, and all power revolved around the One, the power state. Power in the state had no transcendental critique, no God and judgment over it. Its only test was historical and pragmatic. Did it succeed? and power thus was power only if it maintained itself to its own satisfaction and to the satisfaction of the subjects of the state. Since a truly wise power in the state controls by the judicious use of forms and of controls, the opinions of the people, power was thus truly power when, with the uses of terror, religion, good, evil and all things else, it maintained itself successfully. This, then, was a philosophy for the power state and a political philosophy for the Renaissance and the Enlightenment.